Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. I trust you had a great weekend and I thank you for stopping by. Moving on to Africa, Ed Manangagwa's preemptive strike. This is Simon Allison in the Mail and Guardian. That's how some Zimbabweans who have spoken to the Mail and Guardian over the past two weeks have described the current crackdown. For them, it is a replay of the post-election violence 11 years ago in which thousands of opposition supporters were detained, tortured, assaulted or killed. Other Zimbabweans go even further. It hasn't been this bad since the Guku Rahundi when about 20,000 to 36,000 people were killed. The men alleged to be responsible for those killings, like Land Minister Perens Shiri, Vice President Constantino Chiwengwa, and yes, even President Emerson Mnangagwa, are still in power. The crackdown began supposedly in response to popular protests against the imposition of a fuel tax but the sheer scale of the operation in its third week now suggests that it was planned well in advance. It takes careful planning to conduct simultaneous military operations in towns across the country and to organize the targeted detentions and disappearances of community leaders, activists, unionists and opposition party members. The combination of terror and purge has crippled popular resistance to the government for now at least. But this is interesting. From Mnangagwa's perspective, the timing of the crackdown is no accident. Zimbabwe has been staggering through a slow motion economic crisis for the past year. The government is broke, likely to be compounded by shortfalls in agricultural production, which are projected to leave at least 2.4 million people in need of emergency food aid. Manangagwa's government simply does not have the foreign exchange reserves to purchase that food aid. Tobacco, expected to begin sometime between mid-February and mid-March, may also be negatively impacted. How will the government pay its civil servants who are threatening to go on strike? For any would-be autocrat, this last question is almost always the most crucial. The link between hunger and revolution is as old as civilization itself. And saying the crackdown is the Manangagwa's regime's attempt to preempt any potential revolution. As terrifying as Manangagwa's police and soldiers may be, it is clear that Manangagwa and his allies are just as terrified and that they will spare no violence in their efforts to protect themselves. 21st of January, I said the point I'm seeking to make is that there is a correlation between high inflation and revolutionary conditions which is what Simon's saying. I said the mind game that ZANU-PF played on its citizens has evaporated in a puff of smoke. The petrol price hike was the proximate cause and ignited the already dry tinder on the ground. That was Piers Pigou. Sam Farai Monroe told The Guardian the government can switch off the internet, but not the frustrations of millions of people. This is a fact. And on the 21st of Jan, I said, what is clear to me is that Zimbabwe is at a tipping point moment. Moving on, how Washington got on board with Congo's rigged election foreign policy. What Kabila did is really a master play, Bauma said, adding that Kabila's strategy would be a lesson to many dictators to find a very interesting way to rig elections and make it acceptable. And the talking about how the U.S. took a hardline approach and then totally backed off. It's blatant hypocrisy, said a U.S. official. I think the most startling thing is how quickly we have shifted from a discussion about the integrity of the electoral process to sweeping all these very serious and credible allegations of electoral fraud under the carpets of Jason Stearns at the Congo Research Institute. The Economist is writing about the heroin trade that's affecting Eastern Africa. Alizea Smith sits on a plastic crate in front of her fruit and vegetable stand in Cape Town. There is brisk custom for her oranges and avocados and her heroin dealers on the corner just a few meters away. If she does not sell enough fresh produce to feed her habit, she works as a prostitute in the evening. 
Until recently, heroin addicts were rare in Africa. In the 80s and 90s, users could be found largely in tourist spots such as Zanzibar, white hipsterdom in cities like Johannesburg. Since 2006, heroin consumption has increased faster in Africa than in any other continent. The trade in the drug is having ruinous effects, not just on public health, but on politics too. Um, <coughs> talking about how the harvests are now being dispatched along the southern route called the Smack Track. Heroin is taken from Afghanistan to Pakistan's Makran coast where shipments are put on dows. Throughout the year, save for the monsoon season, dows sail southwest through the Indian Ocean before anchoring off Somalia, Kenya, Tanzania and Mozambique. The corrosive effect that the heroin trade is having on politics is most evident in Mozambique. Uh, heroin may be Mozambique's largest or second largest export after coal. And then talking about Mr. Smith's pusher, a 35-year-old Tanzanian migrant by the name of Juma, describes how his patch works. New users are offered starter packs. Repeat users are rewarded for loyalty. A free pellet worth 30 rand for every five they buy. He pays 500 rand for a booster pack from which he nets a 250 rand profit after paying gangs a tax for protection. Though dealing is risky, Juma says it's better than his life in Zanzibar, where he was paid the equivalent of $2 a day for repairing phone lines. That was not enough to support his wife and two children, so he emigrated to South Africa. Shit, it's a tough life, boss, he sighs. South African oil shares up 2.26% year to date. Dollar versus Rand, this is a six month chart. We saw a big rally in the Rand, we're now backing off. Egyptian pound, 17.665. We are safe and sound. Thank you to everyone who's expressed concern and thank you to the crew who managed the situation well. This is Professor Osin Bajo, who had a close shave in a helicopter. Nigerian all shares down 2.53% year to date. Ghana Stock Exchange down 2.97% year to date. The Rosewood trade, an illicit trail from forest to furniture. Fantastic article, Yale E360. A sandy village in northeast Madagascar at first seems an unlikely destination for migrants. It has no hospital, no secondary school, no electricity. Yet its population has exploded to 5,000 in recent years. A few of the houses, usually made from dried palm leaves and stalks, now have concrete foundations and solar panels. Relative wealth is due to its strategic location in the illegal timber trade. It's downriver from Masa Ola National Park, home to some of the world's most valuable rosewood. Um, they bury much of the wood in the sand. Indeed, indeed, one cannot walk far in the village without seeing the rounded tops of rosewood logs emerging from the ground like little submarines. Almost all of the rosewood is headed to China. Um, it's called the ivory of the forest. Trade has boomed in the last two decades. African rosewood is now by far and away the single largest traded CITES listed species in the world. It could be as much as 40%. And then saying you can see the greed. Some of the stockpile logs were only 4 to 5 inches in diameter. Let's move on to Kenya. During the month of January, yields on the 91-day T-bill declined to 7.1%. The 182-day T-bill clocked 8.8%. 364-day T-bill declined to 9.9%. This is uh, uh, an image from Saiton's report of the Government of Kenya yield curve. Eurobonds have been performing this year. This is the 2014 issue uh, where the one of the bond that's maturing um, uh, this year is at 4.2%, while the 10-year Eurobond, which has five more years to maturity, is at 6.9%. The 10 and 30 year, which were issued in 2018, are now at 7.6% and 8.6%. Um, I'd written about this when I said downshifting has seen the US interest curve shift significantly lower. This in turn has boosted frontier and, and sub-Saharan African sovereign debt prices and lowered yields. At one point, the 30 year top 10%, were now below 9 
And I said that because of that rally, this a $3.5 billion call, 2.5 billion of euro bonds and a billion in syndicated loans is tactically the right call. It kicks the can down the road. The Kenya shilling appreciated by 0.9% against the dollar during January. I've written about the shilling severally. The key levers with regard to the shilling are the price of fuel and the scale of inward remittances. Year-on-year -year inflation declined to 4.7 from 5.7% in December. NSC was strong in January. Uh, was strong in January. Currently trading at a P ratio of 10.3, dividend yield of 4.7. Nairobi all shares up 10.03% here to date. It's come bright-eyed and bushy-tailed out of the gates. NSC 20 is up 5.25% so far this year eabl has led the charge in the nsc up a whopping 21.9 percent in january if you're interested in the share price data and the first half earnings release which was the catalyst for this sharp upwards re-rating market cap 1.656 billion dollars uh, trailing p 29.312 half year profit after tax accelerated 33.461 percent have a listen to my short interview with Andrew Cowan. He is the MD and CEO of EABL. Banking sector was strong also during January. NIC Bank up 21.4%, Equity 17.4%, Co-op 12.6%, KCB 8.7%, Barclays 5.5%. Uh, we've got a video of the MindSpeak session. It's called Powering Africa's Distributed Economy click on that, but we will also publish uh, via Rich TV the entire session. Uh, some points that Simon Bransfield Garth made. The growth in the mobile system was 65% over 20 years, and we've seen the growth in the solar energy is 100% over the last five years. Cost of solar is less than the cost of candles and kerosene. The net cost is free. Low-income households are spending $25 billion annually on phone charging and light. We have farmers who've increased their income by, by a factor of 10 through solar-powered irrigation. That's huge. Unilever and APA were part of the panel. And Unilever said 45% of our home care businesses in small sachets. The challenge is to create small packs and make a profit out of it. We have to find balance of price and distribution. The pay-as-you-go economy is part of the Kidogo economy, said Unilever. Around the world, there are about 1 billion people without access to electricity. Um, and then I went back to this book I've been reading called Sapiens. Page 379, he writes, An Ocean of Energy. All human activities and industries put together consume 500 ex exajoules annually, equivalent to the amount of energy Earth receives from the sun in just 90 minutes. Uh, APA's uh, Ashok Shah said we were the first to ensure HIV infected.